What is up guys, Awesome Nerd Show here, and today we're back with another episode of Monday Night Review, going back to Raw and Nitro 20 years ago, and a review of the old, you know, episodes, and we're, like I said, going back 20 years to about a year ago, so we're going back to August 4th, 1997 in this episode, and we're watching uh, Raw number 221 and Nitro number 99, even though they're considering it 100 for some reason. But as last time, we are going to start with Raw and go on to Nitro. Um, so first, as I said, we we'll start with Raw. So Monday Night Raw from the, the WWF. And this took place in Bethlehem, Pennsylvania. And this is the night after uh, SummerSlam 97. And so, of course, had a big night there with change of title and um, just important stuff setting up story. So um, the show opens with the Hart Foundation coming down to the ring for an interview with JR. And of course this is showing off that Bret Hart is the new WWF um, heavyweight champion because he beat Undertaker at SummerSlam. So the there's of course replay showing what happened at SummerSlam and so of course throughout the match um, the Undertaker, or sorry, Shawn Michaels, which was the special guest referee, goes to hit Brett with the chair at one point because obviously with their issues that they had, they're getting in each other's faces and, um, you know, Brett's getting mad at Shawn, Shawn's getting mad at Brett, so Shawn decides to get a chair to try and solve the problem himself. And so he goes to hit Brett with the chair and Brett ducks and he hits the Undertaker. And so that's what's setting up, or of course then from that, Brett was able to get the pin on Undertaker. And so this sets up our um, events that's going to be going on forward from here. And so it goes back into the or to the interview and stuff. You know, Brett's also saying, you know, that he's the best there is, the best there was, the best there will be. And that he proved it last night in the ring because of the whole being able to take a two-on-one. It says um, that, you know, Sean heavily favored Undertaker, but he was, but he, as a Brett, won by outsmarting uh, two Americans, as he stated it. Um, and then he talked about his match with um, the Patriot at the next pay-per-view um, in September. Or in, yeah, September. Because, like, this is weird that it's, I was thinking, because, you know, it just uh, turned August for us. And so I was like, this is so weird that uh, their next pay-per-view's in September. But I guess it is, like, a big distance and it did take place in August. Then we, um, they talk about how at the pay-per-view, or at SummerSlam also, that British Bulldog beat, uh, uh, Ken Shamrock and retained his European Championship, and then Brian Pillman um, lost to Goldust. And if you remember, they set the stipulation up last week that if he lost, he'd have to wear a dress. And um, Brett, you know, says that Pillman is too much of a classy person to wear a dress, so that's not happening. And then Owen lost uh, his match to Stone Cold, and uh, he lost it because and because he was showing compassion for Stone Cold because this was obviously the infamous match where Owen does the uh, pile driver to um, Stone Cold but ends up Stone Cold being too low and so when he does the sit down pile driver or the whatever where he sits down flat instead of going onto his legs or anything like the tombstone um, Stone Cold's neck or head got smashed into the mat and ended up hurting um, doing damage I want to say break his neck but it didn't break it but he obviously had issues and he could barely move um, after after that happening and so um, Owen you know went to check on him and then Stone Cold got it um, grabbed him rolled him up whatever they call him like school schoolboys or something like that and was able to get the win from that winning the Intercontinental Championship from Owen and so by this uh, Sergeant Slaughter comes out obviously he's the new commissioner or that they announced that he's the new commissioner that Grilla Monsoon mentioned on the last episode would be coming to lay down the law, lay down the law. And so that's, they reveal that's who it is. And so he comes out saying, you know, that he's the new sheriff in town and that he's going to lay down the law, you know, for enforcing stuff against the um, Hart Foundation. So he says that Brett will defend, no matter what he says, he will defend um, the title against the Patriot at the next pay-per-view, which I believe is ground zero what they call it. And then Bulldog will face uh, Ken Shamrock again soon. He didn't say when, he just said soon. Um, Pillman will wear the dress um, starting the night and then of course that leads into stuff later on in the night. And Owen will face Stone Cold once uh, 
the doctors release Stone Cold, you know, saying that his neck's um, fine and everything. And then Stone Cold, I can't remember if he comes out to the ring or if he's just in the back talking. Um, but he says he doesn't uh, need any doctor's orders and that he will, uh, f I believe he was in the back at this point, you know, like a backstage segment. Um, but he says, you know, I don't need any doctor's orders. I don't care about that. And I will defend my title tonight against Owen. But as you'll see, that does not happen. So that's in of the first segment with the Hart Foundation. So then we get um, after that a recap of uh, the fans angry after SummerSlam, you know, saying that it's all Shawn Michaels' fault that Undertaker lost the title and he's not um, no good just like Brett and everything. So uh, that was just kind of an interesting thing how they turn on Shawn. Um, like they did after that. Then we get a Nation of Domination interview backstage um, for their up upcoming match. And uh, um, Farouk talks about how they were challenged to a um, street fight at the next pay-per-view, the Ground Zero pay-per-view. And then um, they end up coming to the ring because there's a match of Ken Shamrock versus Kama of the Nation of Domination. And so at the um, beginning, we get a recap of uh, Shamrock um, snapping and attacking officials at SummerSlam after his loss. So the nation then comes out and uh, then Sergeant Slaughter comes running out and of course showing that he's laying on the wall. He comes out and sends all of the nation members besides Kama to the back. So, you know, so that there's not going to be any interference or any shenanigans at all coming from that. Um, so this match, obviously, with um, Ken Shamrock being, you know, former UFC fighter and Kama be um, called the Supreme Fighting Machine, this match is a lot of, like, kicks and uh, strikes like you'd see in UFC, but obviously not with the um, same amount of contact. Uh, but Chris, uh, Ken Shamrock ends up getting the win with his belly-to-belly -belly, um, after the Los Bariquas come out and attack Kama, and Kama ends up chasing uh, the Bariquas off through the crowd following the match um then we get a brockus vign uh, vignette which obviously again brockus never showed up so it's kind of a moot point next then is uh taka michinoku versus brian K christopher in a light heavyweight uh, match because again they're trying to start up and kick off the light heavyweight uh division here as with this whole thing they use sunny she is so every time there's a light heavyweight match uh she ends up coming out and uh she's like the guest ring announcer or whatever so she'll come out and then introduce the competitors um then as brian christopher's coming because taka comes out first and then brian christopher and as christopher's walking out uh jr keeps harassing uh jerry the king lawler about being brian christopher's father because obviously um his name's brian lawler and he is jerry the king lawler's son but they don't act like their father and son at least not yet even though they will compete in matches together and stuff um so we get into the match and so again some of the like highlights or moves coming out of it um brian does a uh goes to do a suplex on taka but taka ends up landing on his feet and then quickly um reverses and does a snap suplex onto brian then there's a point where taka does a um springboard onto brian um outside the ring so obviously brian's outside then we he um jumps and does a spring war out onto him uh, then we get brian uh of course brian christopher here doing he does a set of um suplexes um very similar to if you know anything about obviously eddie guerrero um he does the three amigos and that's um similar to his own but when he goes to do the third amigo as you call it or th um suplex uh Taka ends up um catching brian's leg because obviously with this stuff you hold on to the uh your arm around the neck into like you know kind of like a headlock but facing you know front facing headlock and um they ended up you know like once they do the suplex they're on the ground um who's ever controlled so in this case brian does a rollover with his legs and then you know gets up rolls talk over at that point and picks him up and does the suplex again but three times but on the third one as he's um like flipping his legs up in there to get the flip over talk ends up grabbing a hold of him with his leg and ends up getting like a roll up pin on brian and uh ends up getting the win off of that and then because of that win, it makes Brian Christopher mad. And so he then attacks Taka for the end of the match. Then we get a backstage part where Sergeant Slaughter is at the um, locker room, Brian Pillman, which is funny because Brian Pillman, like his locker room is just a door, a locker room door. And it has a sign that says like Pillman or something, uh, Brian Pillman, something like that on it. Um, and at this point, 
guys like that wouldn't have their own separate locker room because when you open it you see like a, a whole big locker room so obviously that's not really his but um slaughter's knocking on the door and it's so funny um so he's knocking on it and saying like you know pillman brian pillman his name is brian right i'm sure it is i just yeah flying brian okay it's so, so, i thought it sounded weird um but he's you know knocking on them like pillman mr pillman brian pillman and just the way he said it, he's like this is commissioner slaughter you must put on this dress or something and just the way he says it is so funny and like so cheesy and um rehearsed like i won't say rehearsed but like fed to him and stuff um but brian ends up opening the door and um slaughter you know hands him the dress saying that um you know you have to wear this dress until you get a, a win on a raw or just a win in general and so that's you know pisses uh pillman off because you know now he has to wear it until he gets a win then we get into our next match which is triple h versus vader which again was supposed to happen last week but ended up getting interrupted by uh mankind dressed as the cameraman if you remember um so um obviously during SummerSlam, a triple h ended up beating um mankind in the their cage match um we get a paul bear little segment after the recap of SummerSlam, and it's just him alone backstage and he's um you know makes comments about him being more of a man than china will ever be which you know is taking a dig at china and her manly features where people are saying you know is she a woman is she a man and stuff so it just kind of digs at that um then we get the match started and triple h gets um a fence in early on vader kind of like setting up you know that he's going to be dominant throughout the match bear ends up uh tripping triple h and you know as he bounces off the ropes to do a move and once he does that he's you know like strutting around the ring like oh i pulled that off and everything china comes around and she does a drop kick to him which is the first it's not the first physical stuff she's done but it's like anything besides just like grabbing on to someone that she's done so it's kind of impressive and then um vader and triple h ended up fighting outside the ring after the drop kick because you know they end up coming out to see what the pair uh bear and Ch uh, china are doing and stuff and so they're outside fighting and they get the double count out and so that's the finish of that match then next up we get the patriot versus the sultan which we've talked about the patriot last week and now we get the um sultan this time and uh the sultan is who what becomes of rikishi he was known as i forget what his first name was or he may have just went by fatu as the head shrinkers and then fatu as a uh just like a street a street guy but in a positive message way and uh he comes out um but he's in like this weird like red outfit it's supposed to be kind of like a genie type thing um but he's with the iron sheet um so first up we get a patriot interview from this backstage and he's like um you know talking about the whole bret hart stuff saying you know he's excited to get the match at ground zero but he's like um brett's you know complaining about everything he's like yes there are problems here in america and um that we need to fix and he goes i'm here to stand up for it and unlike brett who's just whining and he's like of course the whole america love it or leave it which is a big popular thing that's being said around this time and people you know holding signs with that and everything very to me at least as an american i don't like that at all you know it's whatever at this time uh then we get the at the beginning of the match so of course sultan comes out first and as you have iron Sheik, and he's carrying the iranian flag and then we get the patriot coming out with the american flag so he's standing in the ring waving the american flag and at this time sultan uh, the sultan takes the Iran iranian flag and ends up uh hitting um patriot in the back with it but that get um but from there the patriot ends up getting the um upper hand quickly and does a full nelson slam as i assume that's like his finish i don't know i don't remember if they had a name for it or not but from that the um, patriot ends up getting the win off of it and so he beat the sultan which at this point was undefeated they made mention about that in the um commentary did so patriot ends up getting you know a early or a win off an undefeated person so to help build him towards his match with brett and brett and uh british bulldog and owen come to the ring but um as they're walking down the ring you know brett's in front bulldog and owen are um little behind him and as they're walking down sergeant slaughter comes running out he gets in the front of um bulldog and owen and he's you know stopping them sending them back towards the back and so brett you know walks up to the ring without knowing what's going on he's so he's standing at the ring or on the 
bottom of the ramp looking up at the ring you know talking to bulldog or talking to the patriot up in the ring and um brett you know is like getting ready to be like come on guys let's go get him and he like turns around sees that no that bulldog and Owen aren't there and so the patriot jumps out the ring at that point and then starts um trying to attack or starts attacking Brit, but the referee, the whole group of referees end up coming out and separating the two. Of course, this whole time the crowd's chanting, you know, USA, USA, as they would be again at this point. And then Sergeant Slaughter ends up walking out and um, getting in front of Brett, you know, sending him to the back, ending that segment. And so now we kick off hour two of the war zone with Shawn Michaels doing an in-ring interview with Vince McMahon. And he, you know, comes out, you know, to defend or talk about the stuff that happened at SummerSlam. And, you know, everyone, he says, you know, everyone's blaming him, uh, me. Um, and, you know, people aren't taking responsibility for themselves, referring to Brett and Undertaker in the actions. Through this, Vince ends up getting real upset and, uh, you know, mad at the way he's talking and the stuff he's saying to Vince and everything. So he's like... Um, if that's the way you feel and want to act, you can do this by yourself. And so Vince gets out of the ring and walks back to the commentary table. And he talks about, um, you know, people have been asking since his action of hitting Undertaker with the chair. You know, people are saying that Sean's actually in cahoots with Brett. And he's here, you know, saying I'm not associated with Brett in any way. And uh, mentions how him and Undertaker through all their, I think they said like 10 years or at least his 10 years of working in the WWF at this point. That him and Undertaker have never crossed pass and you know never full on faced each other in a match and so this is going to be the um first time coming up because they're going to end up eventually going to a match at i don't know if they have one at ground zero i can't remember if they do or not but i know they for sure obviously have one at bad blood i think it's called the october pay-per-view where we have the very first uh hell uh, yeah hell in a cell match between featuring Shawn michaels undertaker um but the crowd keeps disrespecting Sean, you know, chanting all sorts of stuff at him. And, um, this ends up uh, getting Sean very mad and angry, you know, yelling at the crowd, cursing him and stuff. And Sean threatens to, uh, super kick the Undertaker down his throat. That's what he says, you know, I'm gonna stick my, super kick my foot down your throat, which kind of sounds funny. And from there, we then get an Undertaker then comes out of the ring for, or out to the ring for an interview. I don't, don't know if there was like a commercial break during this point or if it just went into it, but Sean was no longer in the ring, and so the Undertaker walks out, and Vince comes back into the ring to interview the Undertaker, and so Undertaker says that, you know, Sean will have to pay for the crimes that he committed at SummerSlam, and, you know, talking about the whole thing, well, then Paul Bear interrupts on the um, Titan Tron in a backstage thing, saying, you know, that the stuff from SummerSlam is because, happened because Undertaker is suffering from his sins, and, you know, you know, from this whole stuff, the crowd starts chanting stuff, and he's like, so Bear acknowledges and says, yes, go ahead, all of you, make fun of the fat man, which I thought was funny that he said that, and then he, of course, mentions the whole big thing, which I don't believe this isn't the first time it's mentioned or revealed, because commentary didn't, like, make it sound like it was, but, um, he says that, uh, he, Paul, being Paul Bear, was with Kane, and that Kane is coming and ready to face the Undertaker, and Undertaker, um, you know, like, it's a look on his face, like, what's going on, I don't want this to happen type thing, like a remorse, and so he gets out of the ring and starts walking up the ramp, and as he does, the lights go out, and there's just red lights everywhere, signifying, you know, Kane, that, like, Kane is coming. Then we next get a match between Ahmed Johnson, of course, he's with the Nation of Domination at this point, and, uh, Chains with the Disciples of Apocalypse, and so, uh, Slaughter first, like, as people are, you know, are coming down to the ring, they goes to a backstage segment with Sergeant Slaughter, and he's sitting in a locker room talking with a doctor, or, like, I think it's, like, Stone Cold's doctor, it could just be any doctor, uh, but he says, after reviewing Stone Cold's condition and stuff, that he's not in any right to wrestle, and so he definitely will not be wrestling tonight. So that gives an answer of Stone Cold not being able to face uh, Owen Hart tonight and stuff. So then, obviously, all the teams come out to the uh, ring, and they're getting ready for the match to start, and Slaughter ends up coming out to the ring, sending all the other members of the Nation of Domination and the DOA to the back, you know, laying down the wall like he was brought um hired on to do um the crowd starts chanting ahmed sucks which ahmed is an interesting character i know like i remember him from when i was a kid not very much but i remember you know his name and stuff and i 
me, both my brother, both liked Ahmed Johnson, and we, of course, had action figures of him, and he was always one of our favorites. But he, I've, over the years, you know, I've heard stuff that there was problems with him. He, of course, got injured a lot. His actions backstage and the way he acted with stuff really, like, kind of put a nail in his career. And one of those reasons takes place here in just a few seconds. And so Chains is uh, immediately attacked um, in the right leg, or Chains immediately attacks Ahmed John Johnson's right leg, which ha has a brace on it already. And Yamet Ahmed, uh, you know, obviously gets up from that and they fight back and forth. And he has the upper hand round a moment and he comes out, walks over to the side of the ring towards commentary and, you know, points his ha hand out over out to the commentary and says, everyone's gonna die and immediately JR was like did he just say what I think he said and so stuff like that is you know stuff you don't say I mean obviously you would say that if you were really in a fight with someone but this is you know professional wrestling and you don't say stuff like that especially when the show's geared towards children even though this is approaching the attitude era which was not geared towards ch children be it I was a child at this point watching but then th so throughout the match the break was ended up coming out again and they then since you know none of the other nation or DOA members are out there. The break was end up getting on a uh, chain's bike and like start revving the engine, you know, getting their attention. Ahmed Johnson performs a, his finishing move, the Pro River Plunge, which is like a sit out power bomb. And uh, then the DOA ends up coming out to run off the Bariquas and then the Nation of Domination from there comes out confronts the DOA and the Nations you know stand up in the ring DOA's on the ground and then the Nation all turn and start attacking Ahmed Johnson and so this is r to write him off because he his leg is truly injured or I think it was his leg or shoulder something got injured um at SummerSlam and so they this is them writing him off TV and getting him out of the Nation which then leads to one of the great things to happen to the nation i assume in the next episode or coming up soon then we get the match of the godwins versus the headbangers this is a pretty decent match um it not much you know of note happens throughout the match but mosh ends up uh rolling up uh, phineas but the ref is uh distracted by uh thrasher and while that's he's distracted henry comes in and gives a um a slot drop to mosh while he's got phineas rolled up so he does the whole thing where um he's kind of like i don't know how you so like phineas is rolled up so he's on his back but his feet are like rolled up over him and then mosh is kind of like sitting on hit, hit the back of his legs so it's you know kind of like pushing him down into the mat and then from there he, like i said henry comes in it does the slot drop so drop being mosh down backwards and kind of like you know smashing Phineas even more but with that whole momentum if Phineas ends up you know like rolling through to get out of it and then that allows uh, Phineas to get the pin on mosh for the win by Henry slop drop so that is the match then we get a little segment thing with gold dust and Marlena um, they come out and sit in a special ringside area in the crowd that you know they've like scooted the fans out away from and so Goldust and Mar Marlene are sitting there front um, row and I think they have like gold chairs or something in the crowd and they s just sit there for the next match which is Brian Pillman who does come out wearing a dress and he faces um, spark plug Bob Holly so of course because of him wearing a dress uh, Pillman's very like angry and aggressive so really giving it to Holly um, but Holly ends up getting the upper hand and like as he's doing stuff he keeps like lifting up Pillman's dress and of course Pillman has like a thong or something um, some sort of like really small underwear on of course you know trying to embarrass him and stuff so throughout the match or during the match when Pillman ends up uh, getting up her hand Goldust um, start like holds up a brawl from the crowd just starts like shaking it towards uh, Pillman and that distracts him and so Holly or so that draws Pillman out of the ring to confront Goldust and during this time, there's a count out, so um, Hart, uh, Bob Holly ends up getting the win. And so because Holly won in those terms, Pillman must uh, continue wearing the dress, you know, again next week, again, till he gets a win. And then we get our main event for the night, which is Owen Hart versus Dude Love. Um, so for this, Brett ends up coming out and sitting at commentary, um, and Vince is confronting Brett, you know, saying that because, just because you're a champ doesn't mean, um, you don't think, you know, you can do whatever you want, you know, just, as I said, because you're the champion, and, um, 
Brett's like, you know, um, Sean didn't have to pass the test to, you know, come out and sit at commentary, obviously, because he, you know, was sitting out there last week, and, you know, that Vince is grilling Brett and stuff because he's out there, you know, thinking he's going to interfere in the match. And so because of that, Sergeant Slaughter then co ends up coming out, and he sits on the opposite side of the um, commentary table to be able to sit there and watch Brett to make sure he doesn't interfere. <coughs> And of course, throughout the match or throughout the stuff, Lawler, of course, since he's the color commentary and is the heel person, he's, um, you know, showing support and all this for Brett. And Vince brings up um, why he likes Brett when, after all the years since Lawler showed up, he's always, you know, had problems with Brett, made fun of Brett itself, and always like sided with Owen. Um, and Lawler says, you, you know, things just switch and happen and. He's uh, good friends with Brett now. And so as the match starts, uh, Stone Cold is, shows him sitting in the back watching a monitor of the match that's going on. And so Bulldog throughout the match ends up walking to the ring be, to, you know, try and help Owen in the match. But Slaughter, you know, sees him. And so he gets up, goes around the ring, stops Bulldog at the bottom of the ramp. And because he's distracted, um, Brett ends up getting up and attacking Dude Love, which is been thrown out at ringside at this point and ends up uh shoving him into one of the ring posts obviously you know like knocking him dazed and he gets back into the ring and then owen gets the sharpshooter and applies it to dude and then during this point stone cold ends up walking out to the ring and sergeant slaughter ends up confronting him at commentary because they obviously uh, got rid of bulldog at that point and so he's back at common or he's back at the commentary table or walks back over to the commentary table to stop Stone Cold and while over at the commentary Stone Cold ends up picking up a slammy because Owen is between the ring ropes I think it's the top and middle ring rope and he's yelling at Stone Cold and so Stone Cold grabs one of the slammies off the commentary table ends up smashing Owen in the head with it and uh you know that gets Brett upset so Brett starts to go for Stone Cold but Slaughter's holding him back and so because of Stone Cold hitting Owen it allowed Dude Love to end up getting the pin on Owen and then Bret Hart ends up getting in the ring and uh he starts looking at Owen's head you know seeing if there's any cuts or anything from the slammies and uh they end up you know walking to the back then and so dude loves alone in the ring and he ends up getting um smothered by two ladies in the corner of the ring which when he came out i think he kissed one of them so obviously i assume they're like hired people um to like feed his ego but that's gonna be it for raw number 221 on of course the august 4th edition that we just covered so now we're going to be moving on to nitro okay so now we're doing nitro and this is episode one or well, 99 but they're calling it episode 100 throughout the show you know saying you know this is a monuments night and this they do treat this like a big night like it has a different feel and look to it to me compared to the last week's especially it seems almost like a pay-per-view by the way they're treating and everything um but this nitro is taking place from detroit michigan and of course again on the um august 7th or august 4th edition same as raw but this is a special three hour show because of it being the 100th um edition but i do know they end up going to three hours at some point um i don't know when it is but i know it's relatively soon so that's gonna be have something you know i look forward to instead of two hours being three um but the show starts off with a special introduction by michael buffer which of course is the big ring announcer and he does the whole oh let's get ready to rumble type thing you know he's the guy that does all that and so after he does that ends up going to the nitro girls and i just have to say i don't know where they got these nitro girls from but they are absolutely horrible every time they are on they are never in sync and doing the same dance parts they needed some work going on but from there we end up getting to start kick off the show hot we have hulk hogan and eric bischoff coming out to the ring which of course having those two you know as the big main event starting off the show will really kick it off hot and so they come out obviously they're insulting luger talking about how you know he's not qualified and everything and that their um world you know have the world title match tonight um and hogan mentions that he is the god that made wrestling what it is today which you could argue that he did make it as popular as it is. But you know it's just arrogant of him saying it. And then after um, mentions that after Hogan beats Luger at Sturgis at the Road Wild pay-per-view that's coming up. I think this next weekend at this time. Or I think it's a Saturday. Um, he says that um, he'll be partying. Having a party and he'll be doing it with the number one contender so that he named the number one contender being scott hall so i don't know what scott hall did to deserve the match because he's currently the tag title champion or the tag team champions with kevin nash but you know hulk mentions him because they want to keep the title in the family sort 
um, so to say so, the New World Order. And then we get to our first match, which is Mortis, which I believe Mortis became Crowbar. I'm not sure about that, or um, uh, Canyon, I think Chris Canyon. I'm not sure about that, but I think that's who it is. Um, but he comes out with uh, James Vanderberg, which is um, Father James Mitchell, which is was big in TNA with Abyss. And he ran the, I think it's, it was called like the Disciples of the New Church or something like that. So this is like the first time we see him. And then, so Mortis is facing off against Kurt Henning. And so throughout the match, uh, Vandenberg keeps interfering in the match, um, causing Kurt Henning to attack him. Um, the match is a pretty decent uh, match overall because you, I've heard, you know, a lot of good things about Canyon. And then, of course, Mr. Perfect being the good wrestler he is. And throughout the match, I noticed there are some guys I assume to be like security and stuff. They end up taking a sign from someone in the front row. Which I just noticed that and want to comment on it because, you know, that stuff still happens to this day. Henning ends up getting the win with his super, um, superman, fisherman suplex as you would expect him because he's uh, obviously going to beat Mortis. Um, then we get a recap of Sting being that he is, has been silent for 12 months and not said a word. Even though I somewhat question that because I didn't think it was, uh, that long, but at this point because obviously this is august and he doesn't really do anything till i think december if i am correct i don't know though but we get that so then we get our next max of chavo and hector guerrero versus jeff jarrett and dean malenko with deborah um jared is obviously hev heavily booed and there's a big huge um jarrett suck chant that goes on um commentary mentions that there's issues again with the guerrero family of chavo and hector with eddie um so there's something going on there and throughout the match hector never tags chavo and commentary makes a point you know he needs to tag chavo he needs to get the fresh man in but that ends up being his downfall and Dean Malenko ends up getting the win on him with the Texas Cloverleaf. Then we get an interview with me, Gene, and he's standing uh, ringside at, you know, at the uh, barrier. Raven is sitting there in the crowd, so this is like the, I don't know if it's the very first time, but it's the first point I've seen Raven in the WCW. And so as you stand there trying to ask Raven questions, um, Steven Richards, they call him Swinging Stevie Richards or something like that. I don't, I don't know what he is. I never knew he was in WCW at all anyways. But he ends up coming out and uh, interrupting and saying, you know, that he's worked on um, a contract for his man Raven and that Stevie got Raven the contract so that he could follow him and follow him as in Stevie into WCW as well. And he tries to hand the contract to Raven, but Raven ends up uh, spinning on Stevie and shoves him backwards. And then Stevie come like goes back up and uh, Raven goes to punch him, but Stevie blocks him. And he says, you know, you're not going to abuse me anymore. So I assume there's some sort of like slave master relationship going on there that they're dealing with. But like I said, I've never seen him either one of them yet at this point WCW so I don't know exactly what's going on I know they obviously had stuff in ECW but I you know wouldn't think that stuff would carry on to WCW um then we get a I don't know what you call it, like a promo type thing for the whole Nitro Party contest so it's obviously you um like write or send something in showing or telling what you would do to celebrate Nitro like a big party at your house or something and then they're going to choose someone to win and then you know, give them or pay, give them money or whatever to be able to do a Nitro party. Uh, then we get another match of the Giant versus uh, three, so it's obviously a handicap match. So Giant versus uh, Lenny Lane, which um, I forget what his name, if his name changed or not, but he became a tag team of I think Lenny and Lodi. I don't know if they had any other name, which was in WCW. I think maybe um, t early TNA. Joey Mags, which I don't know for sure who he is, and Scott Demore, which is currently or at least was a big backstage person in TNA for a long time. Um, so when Big Show or Giant, I mean, comes out, he as he does now, when he gets in the ring, he, like, does the whole, like, hand up in the air, you know, like, signaling for the choke slam. But when he does it this time, there's pyro that comes off from the ring post, kind of like Kane does, or like Kane has. So that's the first time I've seen that. So, again, I died make mention of that because, and that even back, 20 years ago, Big Show is still doing the hand up in the air type thing at the beginning of matches. And obviously with the handicap match and being who it is, the Giant easily destroys all three of the guys. And he pins all three by uh, choke slamming them next to each other. So he puts one down, then puts one to the right of him, puts one to the left of him, and then lays on top of um, one of them and puts his in the middle one and then puts each hand on each of the other two guys and pins them. Then Macho Man end up uh, in, with uh, Miss Liz with them coming out, or coming out after match onto the ramp. And and he says, you know, at Sturgis, Macho Man will be in control and that the Giant needs to stay put, whatever that kind of means is weird. And so the Giant then gets out of the ring and starts
starts running up towards uh, Macho Man and they all disappear. We then get a package on Lex Luger, Luger just covering his career in WCW leading up to his match with Hogan. And then we get another match of High Voltage versus Public Enemy. Um, so High Voltage is Rage and Chaos and then Public Enemy is Rocco Rock and Johnny Grunge. Um, so throughout the match, uh, Rage end up, ends up doing a bulldog onto Rocco Rock off the top rope, which Rage and Chaos are two big, beefy, muscular guys. So, you know, one of them coming off the top rope is just kind of a weird thing. Um, there was a lot of problems throughout the match and commentary, you know, made point of this and stuff. Um, say like Chaos uh, never tagged Rage and so the ref had to, you know, stop high voltage, you know, set him straight, you know, whoever, you know, was the first person it has to do and then you have to tag and all that whole stuff. And they have uh, many tag issues throughout the match, um, you know, not tagging and someone just jumping in and attacking and then facing, you know, figuring out who's the legal man and all that stuff. So very new guys going into the match here. Public Enemy sets uh, Rage up to go through a table because obviously they're like, an early version of the Dudleys because I think the Dudleys were around at this point but um, I know Public Enemy was big in using tables and so they, of course they carry a table out to ring every time they come out and so they had set the table up at ringside and so they set um, Rage onto the table and Rocco Rock goes to do a flip over like over the top rope from the ring onto the floor on the table but Chaos ends up pulling Rage off of the table and so Rock, um, Rock just ends up going through the table. Commentary you know discusses keeps mentioning high voltage lack of experience and that they're wasting time because after that they should have gotten a pin on johnny because i think obviously rock goes out through the table and so they get uh johnny grunge in the mat or in the ring and you know double team him and that they should be getting the pin but they're just wasting time doing other stuff but johnny grunge ends up getting the pin on rage and then he afterwards is mad about it and gets up and attacks uh, Johnny Grunge and then Chaos goes out grabs um, half of the table like a small half of the table that broke off and comes in and starts um, attacking Grunge with that ending their match then we get another Nitro Girls dance segment again horrible dancing but as they're dancing um, Alex Wright ends up walking through the um, entrance and comes out between the girls and starts doing his uh, dance between them and they all just kind of look at him all weird and stop dancing and walk away and then uh, Mean Gene comes out and interviews Alex Wright and he starts speaking in German and you know Mean Gene says hey hey buddy this is America you need to speak English and uh so again stuff that we still see going on today you know this is America you need to speak English and everything but he discusses you know that he's an upcoming match with Chris Jericho at the uh, Road Wild pay-per-view and you know maybe he'd be able to speak German if Americans were educated and learn other languages so then we get his match against Scotty Riggs of course one half of the American males tag team. Alex starts off the match very strong and aggressive at the beginning. Scotty ends up climbing to the top rope and Alex um, of course hits the ropes and Johnny or Scotty falls off the top standing up off the top rope so where you know it like chokes himself so he hits like his chest or neck area in this case off the top rope and then um, Alex ends up doing a drop kick off the top rope to get the pin. I don't know if that's like his finisher or if that's just like a signature move of his but that's what he ends up using and then we get um, the start of hour two of Nitro and with an, again another Mean Gene interview on the ramp and this time with Lex Luger and he just talks about you know that he's going to beat Hogan and that he's going to become the new um, heavyweight champion and everything and that's all that really consists of. Then we get a match of six versus Chris Benoit and this was a pretty good match. It was just very um, interesting of like the moves that are going on here. So it's a very fast paced like um, match like each person like every time they do a move it's very fast paced like especially I noticed with like six so like he has Chris uh, Benoit down at one point six like goes bounces off the ropes and then goes to do like a leg drop but he does it like so fast and I'm like I don't see how he's not just like sitting on the person's head as fast as he's doing it but uh so at one point Chris Benoit does a suicide dive man so like you you know hit six and as they're falling to the ground he just his body just lands on top of six's head but you know six doesn't seem to show any problems with it but I just thought it looked nasty um six after doing those whole leg drop things I was just talking about he ends up going to the top rope and rope and does a somersault leg drop so obviously he does a front flip to land on with his leg across the neck of Benoit but Benoit ends up moving away from it at one point six is you I forget 
I think he's up at the top rope or something happens and he ends up um, sitting backwards on the top rope. Chris Benoit comes up and grabs him to do like a back suplex or like a, just a back slam, you know, pick him up and fall backwards off the ropes. Um, but as he's up there, Jeff Jarrett ends up running out and attacking uh, Benoit from behind. And then because of that, Mongo, Steve Mongo McMichaels ends up coming out and attacking Jarrett. And then Dean Malenko comes out. And he starts attacking Benoit while Mongo's fight to Jarrett. And uh, Benoit and Mongo end up standing tall in the ring. Then we get, of course, another Nitro Girls dance part. Uh, then we get the next match of Vincent, or uh, Virgil, as you know, from WWF. And the Billion Dollar Man's uh, man servant type person. And he's facing off against Booker T. Which Booker T comes out with Stevie Ray because obviously they're Har Harlem Heat. Uh, Vincent ends up trying to uh, leave like, you know, Booker T's getting off Vincent on. And so Vincent, you know, gets out of the ring. He like motions his hands at the ring like, you know, I'm done with this. I don't. I'm tired of this. And so he starts walking around the ring to leave. But uh, Steve Ray ends up coming around the ring and attacking him. And of course, the whole time this is going on, Booker's um, like distracting the ref so he doesn't see. Booker ends up getting um, the pin off what they call the side. I think they call it a Harlem sidekick. Um, not exact. Or if it was just a sidekick. But I assume it's supposed to be one of his moves. And Vincent ends up then getting beat up by both the Harlem Heat and the ring. Uh, then we get another Mean Gene interview with DDP. You know, he talks about how he has a respect. Um, spec for Flair, but if Flair is associated with Kurt Henning because he hates Kurt Henning, that means he doesn't like Flair as much. Um, but you know, he says he does respect him and he will beat him tonight in their match that's coming up. And that leads into a match of the Barbarian, which of course was in WWF a bunch of times. And he's facing off against uh, Wrath, which is Mortis and Mortis's uh, teammate. And he comes also out with uh, James Vandenberg again, James Mitchell. And Wrath, I wasn't sure who it was at first, so I had to look up, but he was a uh, Brian Clark, which was um, Adam Bomb, if you didn't know. And I liked Adam Bomb, so. Um, I thought that was cool. Um, but Rath ends up getting a lot of like of the offense in, in this match. So he does a um, top rope clothesline at one point and ended up doing a replay of it at one point um, at the end of the match. So it must have been impressive. Um, he does a headbutt to um, Barbarian, but Wrath himself ends up getting hurt because they're obviously playing off the Simone thing. That they have hard heads and, you know, it's always been a thing that any of them, every time you headbutt them, it doesn't hurt them. It just hurts yourself or if they headbutt you, obviously it hurts you. Um, but Wrath, obviously, with what I said, ends up getting the win with his move called the Death pen Penalty, which is just some sort of, like, side slam. It's almost like a rock bottom, um, but not nearly as good. And after the match, uh, Ming ends up coming out and just, like, standing over Barbarian, protecting him. While, you know, Wrath, they come, they're just, like staring each other off waiting for one to move and nothing ever happens uh then we get another interview with mean gene poor mean gene's just all over the place tonight but he comes out and does an interview with the steiner brothers which of course they're in michigan so they get a good reception but then they end up bringing out uh ted dibiase which obviously is the million dollar man as you know but he discusses you know that he's um learned the air of his ways and he's here to keep the promise he made to his father because his father ended up dying in the wrestling ring his father was also a wrestler and that he's um said he made a promise to his dad that he's always going to do the right thing and by that he's gonna do the right thing by tearing down the um what he helped create from the inside out which why well, he helped create was the nwo because he was obviously an early member of the nwo itself and so he's back here going against the nwo and from that hall and nash end up coming out uh they threaten you know dbs you better you know keep your mouth shut about stuff and that um once you're in N um nwo you're in nwo for life and then that's where it kind of ends we then get another nitro girls segment i'm hoping there's not much more after that but you never know uh then we get uh lee marshall calling in for his road report again from dim or this time from denver colorado obviously that's where they're going to be next week's show and again he makes another weasel uh comment about a weasel sort of thing i forget what they he mentioned it to or like it the two because he said something about like some like some sort of animal like exhibit or something and he's like maybe they'll have a weasel exhibit or something because he always throws in a dig at bobby heenan then we get a match of psychosis who comes out with sunny ono and he has his match against conan again conan's on his quest getting rid of all the mexican wrestlers that he brought in from mexico with his connection um psychosis at one point does a spinning leg uh lariat off the top rope which looked really cool but conan ends up winning with the tequila sunrise and conan is with the nwo at this point i don't know if i mentioned that in the last episode but with his um whole mission he's going on and being a part of nwo he gets going to be getting a lot of wins but then ray mysterio jr ends up walking out and he's on his crutches still similar to last week 
Um, but he comes out in the ring and uh, I think Conan ends up taking one of the crutches. And at that point, uh, Rey Mysterio takes his other crutch and smacks it over. Conan showing that he doesn't need the crutches anymore. And that his leg is all better and he's ready to go. Then we get a match, a weird tag match with Silver King and Damien. Which are two guys I've never seen or heard of. I want to say Silver King is uh, Hispanic and Damien is maybe Japanese. I don't know for sure. That's just the way they look. But they go in a um, match against Glacier and Ernest the Cap Miller. Ernest uh, gets the win. Like I said, there's not much that goes on in the match. So anything new. I mean, obviously with the Glacier and then Ernest Cap Miller being uh, his like karate background. They do, of course, a lot of like karate type moves. Ernest ends up getting the win with, I had no clue what to call it. I just, so I just call it a switching roundhouse kick because they call it a roundhouse kick but he gets on the top rope he from the you know is facing like you normally would on the top rope he ends up jumping in the air f and like flips around so he's then standing backwards on the top rope like he's gonna do moonsault or something but then he jumps and switches back around and as he switches around he does the roundhouse kick at that point so i thought that was really cool i've never seen anyone do that before then we get an eric bischoff in-ring promo and uh, he comes out complaining about the actions of the giant and um, larry zabisco from last week obviously if you remember larry zabisco came out to commentary when he when uh bischoff was at the commentary table grabbing bischoff dragging him to the ring to the um giant and giant choke slamming him and so james a dylan comes out to the ring and i think like i said last night, i think he's supposed to be like the president of wcw at this point but um eric says you know tells him that um he will sue the giant if the giant ever touches him again and that if zabisco ever um touches him again that he will kick zabisco between his eyes and then so that's all that goes on in that segment and then we kick off the hour three so again three hour nitro going on here and of course starts off with the nitro girls and this time they're dancing at the commentary table and of course all the tony Schiavone and bobby heenan are of course like freaked out being acting crazy about the whole thing um but then we get our match of diamond Dallas page versus rick flair so early in the match kurt henning ends up running out to ringside after um page does some sort of slam on flair i couldn't tell if it was like a power bomb or some other um similar move and so he's there at ringside uh page ends up doing a swing net breaker and he ends up getting up on the ring to distract it then that leads flair to do to like do you know a tackle shoulder tackle into ddp's leg so attacking his leg setting it up for the figure four um so flair gets the figure four put on page but page is able to get towards the rope and it's revealed um then reverse so page puts a figure four on flair and as the ropes you know, or the ref is you know down trying to check you know see if he's tapping or anything um flair ends up getting the ref and poking him in the eye so the ref you know gets away at that point kurt henning comes running in to help out but as he gets close to page page ends up grabbing him and rolling like rolling him up into a pin but obviously he's not in the match so he can't do much of anything but he's holding him there and uh from there uh page you know gets the upper hand because obviously after the roll up thing henning gets back out of the ring and they continue the match but then page gets the other upper hand and Kurt gets up into the ring and he has brass knucks calling for um, the ref calling for the DQ even though they haven't really done anything and he ends up like tossing him to Paige or something I don't understand Paige puts him on and then uh, uh, he like has him on but he never does anything with him and he like throws him away and then they start fighting he fights off both Flair and Henning then next up we get a ma tag team match of Viano um, number four and five so these are mass luchadors versus Hector Garza which is um, kind of a, like a I'd say like a big name in uh, wrestling because I think he's been in TNA a lot with them um, but it's him and Liz Mark Jr. So let's see throughout the match uh, Hector um, ends up doing a jump um, up to the top rope and onto the floor with a corkscrew plancha onto um, Viano 4 and 5 out on the floor but the um, Vianos end up getting the win um, with a small package because um, they do a whole switch so you know one's in the ring got all the damage but then when the ref's not looking they switch out and then when the person that the ref was dealing with um, rolls over to pin them or whatever they end up grabbing them and rolling them up but this was a very um what you'd call like a luchador mass so there's a lot of high flying a lot of very fast quick pace moves but yet there's you know some botches and stuff as what happens with luchador matches and we get another in-ring interview um with uh mean gene uh, but this time with uh james j dylan and he talks about um the whole sting thing that's going on that he mentioned last week and so it comes out presenting an offer he made for sting sting repels down from the ceiling which i believe this is not the first time he's done that but the first time i've seen him do it since watching these nit uh, nitros again so sting is in the ring and jj offers him a match and says he's found you know the perfect opponent for him and everything which um, he ends up saying is kurt henning but sting grabs a contract rips it up and ends up walking out back through um the main entrance 
So showing that he's not going to give in to um, JJ's offers. Then we get our last Nitro Girls dance routine, which hopefully, I was going to say, hopefully we don't see anymore, but I know we will, obviously, in more episodes. And then that brings out Michael Buffer to introduce the main event, you know, doing his same routine stuff. And then so that our main event is Lex Luger versus Hollywood Hogan for the WCW world title. So mainly from the start of the match, Hogan gets a lot of... There's, a lot of Hogan suck chants, or Hogan suck chants, very similar to seeing um, John Cena or like Roman Reigns and stuff nowadays. Um, but commentary stresses, you know, because Hogan obviously has the um, upper hand early on in the match, but they, you know, they stress, you know, Hogan doesn't have to get the win or the pin to win this match, you know could be disqualification or anything Luger's the one that has to end up winning the match and throughout the match Hogan's you know using dirty tactics as you would as a heel using things like eye pokes and count limits so you know holding stuff till the count of five holding someone in the ropes attacking them all sorts of stuff like that um but Luger ends up kicking out after the bit um a big boot and a leg drop obviously it's not um he does a big boot or Hogan does a big boot covers him Luger kicks out then he does a leg drop Hogan um, Luger kicks out. So they're booking Luger strong here. Um, so after those two attempts, Hall and Nash end up, or Hall, Nash, and Macho Man all come running out to try and attack Luger. But as each one of them gets in the ring, Luger's able to fight them off. So he's able to get offense in on them, but they're not on him. So it's not getting a dis um, disqualification. And from and once he gets Macho Man knocked out as the last person, he ends up running across the ring, um, nailing Hogan with his forearm, which um, Luger early in the 90s was in a motorcycle accident and like got his arm all tore up so he got a metal plate put in his forearm to hold his arm together and so he always used that as like a forearm with the metal in there to be like a knockout mechanism but he does that and then picks uh, Hogan up for the torture rack and while in the torture rack Hogan ends up giving up so Luger wins the WCW championship from Hulk Hogan and so this is a big celebration so all pretty much every uh, non-NWO member comes um, from the back room ends up coming out so whether they're good guys bad guys doesn't matter they all come out to the ring in celebration you know pick up Luger on their shoulder and celebrate and then it shows them going to the back celebrating in the locker room with champagne and all sorts of stuff, you know dumping on each other um it's kind of weird I didn't know what's going on but you see Giant there and he grabs a um, rag of some sort and this container of liquid kind of like you know, like a weird small gas container or um, some sort of like weird strong cleaning solution and dumps it on the rag and I'm like Oh my god, he's going to do like a whole chloroform type thing on Luger or something like that. But it must be some sort of like, some sort of remover. Because he grabs the title belt and starts rubbing it. Because you know, Hogan, as with the NWO, ended up spraying NWO along the title faceplate. And so he's like, you know, rubbing it to try and get the paint off. Then we get a flip over to um, the NWO locker room. And they all come in, you know, Hogan's freaking out backstage. And he's asking, um... The, you know, the NWO members, will they have his back at um, Hogwild, you know, to keep him, you know, up to be able to win the match at um, uh, Roadwild. I keep calling it Hogwild for some reason. But that is the end of um, Nitro. Of course, that was a pretty big monument. It's like Nitro. It was a pretty fun episode. The matches were somewhat pretty decent. And then, like I said, with it being the big three hour show feel and like I said it seemed like it was taped different had a whole different feeling more like a pay-per-view even though it was just a nitro but that was nitro 99 like I said even though they call it 100 which I believe I looked up and a thing said that it's called 99 because I guess one nitro was like on a Saturday or Sunday and so they you know since it's not Monday nitro they don't consider it but it technically was the 100th nitro but so that was a good show again you can see then the comparison between raw and nitro for August 4th 1997 um, so that's gonna be it for this week's Monday Night Rewind. So again, if you enjoyed this video, please leave a thumbs up. Leave any comments you have for me down below and hit the red subscribe button to see more. And we'll see you next time.